All right, welcome to the second session of Explore Caltech 10 Minute Science Talks. I'm John Bostic, and I'm here with Pablo Garrido Barros. We're both postdocs at Caltech and co chairs for outreach in the Caltech Postdoc Association. Thank you for joining us today. These 10 minute talks are a way for the Caltech community and alumni to share their interests in science and engineering. Thank you for all who are involved in making these talks possible. A special thank you to the speakers today. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that these talks are being recorded. And for those who cannot attend the live session, we'll be posting these videos to explore.caltech.edu. We will also have question and answer session after each of the talks. You may submit your questions through the Zoom chat feature by sending a message to me, the host. But also, you'll be able to ask questions directly by using the raise your hand uh, option during the question and answer session. But while the speakers are presenting, please keep your video off and your microphones muted. And now, Pablo will introduce the first speaker. Welcome everyone. I'm excited to introduce today this second session with John about the online Explore Caltech. I think today is also going to be a very multidisciplinary session with topics ranging from physics, material science, to geology and environmental science. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, that is Eduardo da Vega. Eduardo is a graduate student, uh, third year, I believe, in bioengineering. Uh, he's working processing genomic data. And this is a topic that is very promising nowadays due to the importance of managing the huge amount of data stored in our genome. But however, he's here today to tell us about one of the most popular technologies of the last years, I would say, that is the 3D printing. This technique has shown potential application in many important fields. So we hope you can learn a little bit about how it works with Eduardo. Eduardo, thanks for being here today and the stage is yours. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so my name is Eduardo. I'm a third year graduate student in bioengineering. But what I'm going to talk uh, to you today about is something that I started learning uh, five or six years ago um, when I came to the US uh, from Brazil and uh, as a transfer student. Uh, I discovered that uh, where I did undergrad, Brandeis University, that they had the 3D printing club. And uh, I just fell in love with it because it's so much fun um, and it's such an accessible technology. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about how you can get started uh, with it today and what is possible. So first thing, I'm going to share my screen. And make it full screen. All right, so everybody says this, all right. <clears throat> so um, one thing that I want to, to let you know is that people usually have uh, a lot of questions about uh, what printers and what software to use. Uh, and uh, to make your life easier, uh, I made a handout uh, that's also linked in the, um, in the Caltech Explorer website. Um, and in this handout, it has a few notes about uh, software and printers uh, to get you started. Um, so let's go. So sometimes, you know, you, you got to build stuff. Um, and especially if you're in a science lab, you really have to build stuff. Um, because for some problems, you can buy uh, an off-the-shelf solution. But for a lot of problems, you are, you are the first one or one of the first ones that are they're tackling it. Um, or you want to do something slightly different. Um, and if there is a, a commercial solution, it's often very expensive. And it's usually not very flexible. So in this picture, I'm showing you um, a few things that we use uh, at Caltech, which are 3D printed. So, uh, the first one here is a bunch of uh, 3D printed um, tube holders. Um, in the lab, we have 
uh, lots of uh, different size tubes to hold liquids when we're, we're, when we're doing experiments. Um, and sometimes you, you just don't have the right combination. So a friend of mine, he designed this uh, modular tube holders that you can print and assemble together in the combination that you want. Um, down here you have some molecular models that I make. Um, I started making them for fun, uh, but they are also very useful for teaching. And so I have helped uh, with my, in, at my undergrad, I helped with several courses, uh, biochemistry courses, uh, with training models, uh, but also at Caltech, I have helped TA um, intra biochemistry courses using models that, uh, that you can print. And here is a, a pair of uh, syringe pumps, which is a piece of lab equipment that me and my friend Sina, who is in the picture, we designed them uh, so that you could print uh, and customize them. And when you're designing something, it usually goes like this. Uh, you come up with an idea, uh, you sketch it out, you know, you, you about brainstorm, you bounce things around, and you choose your manufacturing method. Then you actually do the design, and then you actually make the thing, you test it, and you iterate. Um, and until recently, you know, the manufacturing method um, was a big bottleneck because it was uh, expensive or required specialized materials or, or, or equipment. Uh, and with 3D printing, the, the whole thing is hugely simplified. I mean, the, the steps are basically the same. But now you design something on your computer, you prepare it for printing, and you get it printed in an hour. And to show you, uh, just to drive home how easy it is, um, here's a, a real life example from um, a friend of mine in the lab. She, uh, she was working with this, this piece of equipment that is a, a gel um, uh, comb that's used to run samples. Uh, and basically what she wanted is see that this one has 15 teeth, this one has 20. She wanted one with uh, 30. Uh, teeth so that you could run 30 samples at once. And in the span of uh, one hour and a half, um, we measured the, the gel comb, uh, sketched it out, took the dimensions, then uh, I, I drew it on um, Fusion 360, which is a CAD uh, software, computer aided design, and then we printed it. And much to my surprise, this one on the first try, it worked. Um, this all happened in less than two hours. We went from, Eduardo, can you help me with this, to like, here's the thing, and it actually works, and she actually used it. Um, the pumps that uh, were in the other picture are another example. Those, that was a little bit of a longer project, um, but now uh, you too can go online and, and download the um, the models and order um, a few extra pieces on Amazon, um, a few screws, uh, when a motor, uh, and assemble um, for, I think it's like uh, $30 each, um, a piece of equipment that usually costs at least a few hundred dollars and is more flexible than what you'd normally get. Um, and so I've been talking about 3D printing, but um, one thing to keep in mind is that there are many, many kinds uh, of, diff of 3D printing technologies. Um, what I've shown you was printed in plastic, but you have printers that can uh, print in metal. Uh, those you can't have uh, on your desk, and uh, they don't cost a few hundred dollars. They usually cost a few hundred thousand dollars, or maybe even a few million dollars, uh, like this uh, over here. Um, and today we're just going to, you see, we're just going to talk about two technologies. All, all this um, uh, squares here at the bottom, they represent different 3D printing technologies. I'll just tell you about two technologies that you can buy uh, online and, and, and play around with your home. One is the extrusion-based 3D printers, that uh, those are the most popular. And the other is uh, stereolithography or uh, resin-based printers where they will cure uh, a polymer and, and make it solid layer by layer. Um, and so this is how a printer that 
you can buy looks like, and that is the actual price tag. Um, so at Caltech in the library, um, we have this too. Uh, we don't have uh, resin printers in the library, but I bought uh, one of these and I, I, I tucked it away uh, in, a, in a fume hood in the lab uh, because this one's a little messier. Um, and I play around with it sometimes. Um, not these days because you can get to campus. Um, but these are extremely affordable, only a few hundred dollars and you can buy like an actually nice uh, machine. Um, and so I'll just very quickly explain uh, how they work and show a little bit of um, of the possibilities. So this is uh, how an SLA printer works. And what you're seeing here is there is a, a vat of liquid um, that is full of resin. Um, and there is a laser uh, together with uh, a gantry and some mirrors that goes around and shines just at the right spot uh, to harden the resin. And it shines for just long enough that it will create uh, a solid piece of resin that is, has the right thickness, which in this printers um, is usually on the order of 50 micron, you know, 25, 50, 100 micron. It's so fine that you usually cannot uh, see the layers with the naked eye, unless you get like really closer, you get a, a magnifying glass. So these printers are really nice, uh, for example, for printing D&D uh, &D miniatures. Um, in fact, I, I have a couple of friends that, that do that. You know, you, uh, you print them and then you paint them and then you, you can't tell uh, that, it, that it was printed. You can't see the layers at all. Um, but the most, uh, common kind of 3D printing technology is essentially a glorified hot glue gun. Uh, it's called a fuse, fuse deposition model, modeling. Um, sometimes people also uh, uh, call it fused filament fabrication, uh, which means the same thing. And the idea is just that you have a piece of filament that is going through an extruder that heats it up and uh, extrudes it in a in a thinner um, in, a, in a thin pattern uh, and and draws layer by layer uh, your object. Um, <clears throat> and so this is what the filament looks like. Essentially, any plastic um, ABS that's the stuff that Lego is made of, or PLA that's the stuff that um, a lot of plastic cups are made of. It's made, made of cornstarch, uh, PET, that's the, the stuff from Coke bottles. Anything that uh, you can melt at about two to 300 degrees, uh, you can print with. Uh, and so the most commonly used uh, material is PLA, um, which costs about 20 to $30 per kilogram. So it's like really cheap. It's really affordable. Uh, and that means you can iterate a lot and you can fail a lot. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, the head uh, is extruding just a little bit of filament uh, and moving around. And once it's finished with one layer, it moves up and then continues printing. And it does another layer and moves up and up uh, until it's done. Um, this is what um, an extruder uh, looks like the filament will come on from up here. It will get pushed by this uh, gear here into this part that's the hot end that, that heats up and melts it. And then it gets extruded over here um, like this. This is a close up uh, and, and deposited in your object layer by layer. Um, and so and one of the main features of uh, FDM is that it has this very noticeable uh, layered aspect. And that means that it's, for example, it's not food safe because it's impossible to clear up the layers. Um, that also means that if you wanna make a vase, it's really, really hard to make it 
watertight. Um, but other than the aesthetics and, and, and those considerations, um, it's a really uh, versatile uh, technology. Basically, anything that's plastic, uh, you can print. Uh, here's a close up of uh, sound. This is what it looks like. I don't know if the sound is too loud for you. It just goes on and on and on uh, until your object is done. And so the most important thing is uh, how do you define this pattern uh, that the printer is, is going through? Um, and that is given by um, a file uh, uh, that, it, that is called um, a G code. That, that the file type is called G code. Um, that is basically just a set of instructions move here, move there, extrude this much, um, lay, uh, that tells the printer what to do. Uh, layer by layer. And so when you're preparing a model to print, this is uh, what, for example, a poop emoji keychain looks like. And you notice that um, the object itself is not solid. It has this uh, grid infill that makes it lighter, uh, uses less material, and makes it a lot faster to print. So you basically never print something um, solid. Um, slicing. Uh, is also important because that's when uh, slicing is the, the process of uh, converting your object into G code uh, and creating uh, the uh, layer by layer instruction for your, um, for your printer. It's also important because um, you can tweak uh, your object. For example, if you have an overhang, uh, you can add supports and that will keep your object from uh, drooping. Uh, so you see here uh, with and without supports, and this is what happened. It's basically um, a bunch of spaghetti. Um, you're, you're extruding plastic um, midair. And so a lot of uh, little things uh, can, can go wrong or can go right uh, when, you're, when you're getting your, your printer settings. Uh, just right, uh, but luckily, most of these things are automatically taken care of for you by uh, by the software um, that you use uh, when you're slicing. And so, what this means is that even when you don't get it quite right, uh, you can try again and you can tweak it and you can iterate. Uh, and that's one of the coolest um, aspects of uh, 3D printing is that in a matter of 20 minutes, you can go. Uh, get something printed, see what, what was good, what was wrong, uh, make a tweak, print it again and again and again. Uh, here is uh, some drone frames uh, that a friend of mine designed and printed. And uh, I'm pretty sure he made uh, all of this in, in just one day, a very hectic day. Um, oops. Um, but that also means that, uh, you know, you, you get a lot of failure with, with a lot of iteration. Uh, and that's fine. That, that's how you learn. Uh, you just got to be prepared. Every time you set a print going, you probably have like a 20% chance that, uh, that it's going to fail, depending on, on your printer. Um, and that, that's, that's just part of life. Don't panic. Uh, you know, uh, start again. Um, and so just to uh, close the talk and give you um, an idea of uh, where to go, uh, one place that you, you should check out about to, to get inspiration of um, the kinds of things that you can make uh, is Thingiverse, Thingiverse.com uh, is this website. Uh, and the other place to check out if you want to design something uh, is Tinkercad, which is a browser-based CAD. And now I'm not going to go uh, into detail about CAD here, but I'm just going to say that there's a whole um, range of software that you can use like Tinkercad, which is like super easy, super fun to use all the way to like SolidWorks, which is the stuff they use to make the, the space shuttle. Um, and so check out Tinkercad. It's very fun. I don't have time to, to show you today. Um, and I'm just going to end with this 
cool time lapse of a huge castle being printed because um, basically you can make these printers as big as you want. Um, and uh, I'll take any questions that people have. I don't know if we're going to do them over chat or over audio. Um, maybe I could turn off the music. There you go. All right. Um, maybe I did go a little over time. Yeah, thank you, Eduardo. Uh, yeah, we'll open up the question and answer session now. Uh, you can send me questions over chat or you can uh, raise your hand to ask a question directly. And I think uh, Pablo will ask uh, one question. Yes, Eduardo, thank you very much for that nice talk and the, and the nice demonstration you have in your presentation. That was really cool. So I was wondering, uh, in part related to how you close the, the presentation, so uh, how this 3D printing is in the context of uh, when you need accuracy for your application. For example, let's talk about medical applications. So mm. are the current technologies uh, like at the level of the accuracy that you need for some application like? You know, like we are seeing today that uh, they are using 3D printing for making this breathing mass and all these things. So, are these? Yeah, uh, it basically just depends on your budget. Because uh, when I was over here showing all the different machines that you have, um, you know, the machine that costs $200, uh, you're probably not going to have enough accuracy. Um, to print a, a low tolerance uh, critical piece of equipment. But if you, if you go to a, a, a 3D printing service, they will have a machine that can print in metal or that can print in very high accuracy uh, nylon or uh, very high accuracy resins. And those, uh, the accuracy can go down to just a couple microns, uh, depending on what you want. And even if you're printing uh, in nylon, um, you can get uh, like 20, 20, 30 micron accuracy um, for um, applications where this is critical. But then it might cost you like a few hundred dollars uh, to print your part as opposed to like a few cents. Um, but you, you can definitely do that. I see, thanks. Uh, we have a question from the audience uh, from Jessica Spake. Uh, Jessica, go ahead and ask her question. Hi, thanks. Great talk. Uh, are there any biodegradable materials you can use to 3D print? Yeah, um, bio stuff is, is a little more complicated. Um, the idea is the same. Um, uh, you're basically going to be extruding stuff, except that instead of uh, a, a, an extruder, you're actually going to be pushing stuff off a syringe, uh, like you have here in these uh, syringe pumps. And so the... Um, uh, I have never seen, uh, you know, a bioprinter that you could buy at the consumer level, um, but you, it's it's not terribly hard to modify, uh, for example, um, one of these and replace the, the extruder here with a syringe um, that that is controlled in the same way, and then and then you could have like a janky printer. Um, I've I've had a friend that uh, modified one to uh print cupcake frostings um and there are quite a few labs that work with uh 3d printing of biomaterials um where it's um a lot more accurate um jennifer lewis uh is a researcher at harvard um, and she does a lot of this stuff um it's not cheap uh but it, it it's not like readily consumer accessible uh, but it happens. There is there is quite a bit of uh, research on that. Great, thanks. Yep. Okay, uh, I think that's all the time we have uh, for now. Thank you, Eduardo. And we'll, all right. we'll move on to the next speaker. Well, that Tom made me feel like I want now to get one of these printers. Thanks, Eduardo. Yeah, do it. <laughs> I, I have the tips on the on the handout of the models that I like. Um, Oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you can order them during quarantine and uh, <laughs> should arrive within one week and you, you can get going. <laughs> Great. By the way, thank you very much for your recommendation. I'm sure they will be useful for, for yeah. the people. Okay, so now we are going to move uh, to a different topic that is going to be physics and in fact, specifically how researchers 
managed to obtain information from the universe using telescopes. I think this is quite interesting because telescope is one of the few uh, uh, like techniques that you can get information about processes as important as how the universe was formed. And today we have a, a telescope specialist, Howard Hui, who is going to be our next speaker. And uh, he was a graduate student here at Caltech in the astrophysics department, and he's now a postdoctoral researcher at JPL. So, Howard, thank you very much for being here and looking forward to hear from you. Hello, yeah, can everyone hear me? Um, so, um, first of all, I want to thank you for everyone to come in. Um, and I was uh, actually a grad student at Caltech in physics, and I'm actually still at Caltech, although I spend a lot of time at JPL these days. Um, so let me share my slide. Give me one second. So, um, so again, like my name is Howard. Um, so I'm a cosmologist uh, at Caltech. Growing up, I want to study like history, but I want to study history in like the oldest, like biggest scale. So like, where do we come from? How is this Earth like form? And how about our solar system? And like, you know, ultimately, like, it lead me to a question, like, where did the universe comes from? Well, like, what is it like in the beginning uh, of the universe? What happened in the Big Bang? So today, I want to give you like an introduction of um, the experiment that I did um, in grad school that we built, um, you know, a telescope um, and put it in the South Pole to try to answer these questions. So uh, first of all, here's a, a timeline of the universe. So we're in like the present day, uh, we sit in the rightmost plot um, in, in this uh, plot, uh, holding this state-of-the-art uh, telescope looking out. Since light travel at a finite speed, we're seeing older and older things uh, in the universe when we're looking further and further away. So for example, when we look at the sun, uh, sunlight takes about eight minutes to travel from the Earth, uh, sun to us. So we're actually looking at like the sun eight minutes ago. And when we're looking at like you know, the closest spiral galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, it is about two and a half million light years away. So when we point our telescope to Andromeda, we're looking at you know, the galaxy at two and a half million years ago. So what happened if you point your telescope and looking like the furthest way you can see in the sky? We eventually looking at you know, the baby picture of the universe only 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So what do we see there? Like 14 billion years ago, like looking at like this oldest light in the universe. So this is what we see. And of course, we, like when we look up in the night sky, we don't see this like bright, like green color in the sky. Um, no, the green color is just a scientist that like we put in because for us, like human eye can only see light in a very, very narrow, like visible spectrum. But imagine if you have a microwave sensitive eye, when you look up in the sky, it will lit up like a light bulb. What we're seeing here is the entire sky is filled with this extremely, extremely uniform microwave light, and they're left over from the Big Bang um, 14 billion years ago. But instead of like, you know, just looking at that, if we use a very sensitive uh, telescope, one that can allow us to look at one thousandth of a degree um, difference in temperature, and this is the picture that you end up seeing. So, these are like slightly hotter and colder spot in the sky. And you know, they are caused by this random quantum fluctuation in the beginning of the universe. And they get blown up exponentially in the first 10 to minus 30th second after a Big Bang, a period that we call it like inflation. Um, so this random fluctuation end up creating like slightly lighter and denser region in the sky. And throughout time, these denser region get denser and denser from gravitational force and ending up forming stars and galaxy that we are seeing today. So now that like, we see this, what is the next step? Like, we don't understand how like, these quantum fluctuations are created or how exactly they get blown up in the early universe. So to answer this question, we need to look into this like, cosmic background radiation in even finer detail, especially we not just only need to look at like, the temperature variation, but we need to look at like their polarization signal. 
So I promise, like, no, this is the only plot that I'm going to put up in this talk. Uh, in return, I'll, I'll show you some penguins pictures later. Um, but if we take the map that I just showed you and look at the correlation in the map in different, different angular scale. Um, so in, in a mathematical way, we're doing like a Fourier transform. Um, but it's basically just looking at the correlation between different scale. You see the lines on the very top in here. And you notice the scale, like the unit in this plot is measured um, you know, on the y-axis is in micro degree squared. And so now if we want to look into the physics in the first fraction of a second after a Big Bang, we need to look at like all the signal under like, you know, this lensing BMO uh, plot in the very bottom. And another thing that I want you to look at is uh, this plot is showing a log scale in the y-axis. So every big tick in here is a factor of 10 smaller. So in order to find out like what happened 14 billion years ago in the very beginning of the Big Bang, we need to hunt for you know, a signal that is smaller than one million of a degree um, changes in the sky. So like this brings us to the South Pole, like probably you know, the most remote places on earth, which we have like one sunset and one sunrise a year. And our summertime is warm and fuzzy about like minus 20 degree. And like once you get there, your view is just snow, snow and more snow. And everything is just white and blue sky. So in the picture here I shown is um, the plane that we use uh, to get to Antarctica, um, supplied by the US Air Force. And also um, the, some of the telescope that I'm gonna tell you about. But first, um, why, why the South Pole? It's definitely, I can tell you, it's not because of like the first class seat that we get in this like military plane. Um, or like, you know, seeing penguins when we landed in Antarctica. Or better yet, like, you know, trying to be a penguin yourself. And, you no, know, or maybe run a marathon at the South Pole because, well, what else are you going to do down there, right? But the reason that we go to the South Pole is purely because of science. Many of you um, probably don't know, South Pole is sitting at like 10,000 feet of like ice. So it's 10,000 feet of elevation. And because it's so cold, it's also the driest place on earth. And finally, being so far away from all the civilization, we're far away from all the things that will like interfere with our measurement. You know, for example, like your cell phone tower, city lights and like cars and everything. So all of this really makes like South Pole like um, the best observation like location uh, for our telescope and for our measurement. So then like our team, which is um, called like, you know, it's the bicep experiment, uh, spent many, many months uh, in the lab like building um, this telescope in North America. Then we hop onto a plane uh, flew down to the South Pole around like Halloween time every year to install the telescope. Um, so first, like we need to get our cargo, which they just left it outside, buried under the snow, and we need to take it out. And <clears throat> um, then we, like we did like you know some careful planning. Um, and the most important thing is the beer waiting for us at the end uh, of our calendar when we have the telescope up and running. Except as you can see here, we have a very flexible schedule, easily changed like, you know, by moving around the sticky notes. And of course, like we're building instrument, um, we need to do a lot of last minute, um, very careful precision machining with like hammer and saw. Then you no, know, even in Antarctica, we practice our social distancing. So you no, know, that's very important, like even back in the day. Then here's a, here's a picture of uh, one of our graduate students you know, being like, you know, a little uh, feeling under the pressure, trying to make sure all our softwares are running and our telescope will operate fine. And this is my friend, Jimmy, um, you know, working on the same thing. And when they're like working extremely hard, um, like me being me, what I'm doing is uh, the laziest guy and always taking a nap in my big red. So, uh, but then, you know, after all the stuff, we started put together the telescope like in the lab together. Um, and you need some 
careful like organizational skill to store all those cables and making sure all the circuit board um, that you design are like actually doing what you want them to do. You do a lot of electro electrical like checking like um, multiple times a year, like multiple times a day. Um, and you need some steady hand to install all this detector that you design and build um, onto the telescope. And what you end up seeing here is like uh, the, the focal plane, the camera in, in the heart of our telescope. And after you put all the detectors together, you start closing the telescope up. And you know, after you close it up, you uh, loading, load the telescope into the telescope mount with the biggest wrench you see like in your life. But at the end, you know, you put some final touches outside uh, and you know, if from the picture, you can probably see from my facial expression, it's just you know, a beautiful day, not cold at all. And uh, you know, in this beautiful environment. Um, but at the end, we have a machine that can allow us to look back into the uh, universe 14 billion years ago. So what do we see? Um, like pointing this telescope into the sky. You know, this is what our data looked like, uh, started observing in 2012. And as we're taking more and more data, you start seeing these like pattern um, of the universe emerge, uh, emerge from these like background noise. And by analyzing these pattern, we hope that this will allow us to peek in, like, you know, into the secret of the beginning of the universe. And while we're like busy analyzing data, another thing that is very important is uh, back in the lab, we need to transfer our knowledge to the next generation so that they can build better and more sensitive tel um, instrument in the future. In fact, like just this past year, we have a newer team that went down to the South Pole with you know, an upgraded instrument, one that can you know, hopefully to allow us to really peek in to the past and find out like what happened in the very beginning of the universe 14 billion years ago. So you no, know, I hope that like you know I give you like a very short and crash course about like what we uh, what we're trying to do down in Antarctica. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Howard. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll open it up to the question and answer session now. Uh, I have a quick question for you, Howard. Um, what happens if you have a faulty or broken part? What do you do when you're all the way down there? So, um, like a lot of things that, you know, in the South Pole is like require a lot of planning in advance because it's extremely hard to like shift like new part down there. Um, there are a couple other experiments in the station. We tend to help each other a lot, um, but there are a lot of uh, nervous uh, waiting for new parts to come in from your teammate and from other people like hand carry down. Uh, and that's not a great feeling. Uh, and a lot of time that we have a machine shop down there, um, like I showed you before, um, we did a lot of uh, last minute um, machining with uh, our hammers. Great. I think Pablo has a uh, question to ask you too. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much for, for that nice talk. It's very interesting. So I was wondering, uh, since this telescope is, is always in a fixed position, is there any limitation about the region of the, of the universe that you can, you can observe, yes. I guess? Yeah, so that's a great question. So like for astronomer, they want, we want to look at the entire sky. So like Antarctica, South Pole, is not really the location that you want to put in because at, at, at the South Pole, what you can only see is the southern part of the sky. But the science that we want to do, we actually don't need to look at the entire full sky. Um, what we need is sensitivity. So we're only actually looking at about 2% of the sky, but then we're looking at that for many, many years and, and get like, you know, the really the most sensitive map in, in the world in like in microwave uh, frequency. So, yeah. Mm, okay, thank you. And we have one more question. Uh, why do you look at the microwave uh, frequencies in particular when you're studying this uh, background? So, um, what I skipped 
like a lot of the background information is that like the um the universe start in this very small dense and fire ball and the universe after going through big bang and expanding it started to cool down and uh once it cooled down to a certain temperature uh, that is cold enough to allow photon like light to freely escape from the plasma and those light get uh, sent to us like you know, 14 billion years later to our eye as uh, in the meantime the universe is expanding so um, the light um, get stretched uh, which in, the, in astronomy like we call it like red shift so those light in the beginning of the universe now gets stretched to the microwave frequency so you no know, so now that that's the frequency that we want to look at All right, thank you, Howard. Uh, I think we can move on to our next speaker. Yes, just a curiosity before going on, uh, Howard, how long was it, or what was the longest time that you had to, to be isolated there in the, in the Arctic, in the South Pole? So um, for most of the people uh, in our team, uh, we usually go down there two to three months every year uh, in the summer season, but then we, um, one of our teammate, uh, every year we call like the winter over um basically spend their winter season from february to october uh to babysit and making sure the telescopes are working and so everyone um spent two to three months except for him spend about like 10 months down there every year oh. and those are six months of dark sky negative 100 degree in the winter uh and talking about social isolation that is probably the prime example of that. Yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Well, yeah. in fact, talking about the weather, I think we're going to move to our last uh, talk today that is about uh, uh, environmental science and geology and the, and the weather, in fact. And it's going to be presented by Peter Martin. So Peter was a graduate student here at Caltech in the Geology and Planetary Science uh, 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 Department. And now he's a postdoctoral researcher in the University of Colorado Boulder. So today he's going to talk about the history of our uh, climate that I think is a very appropriate uh, topic to talk about because after this COVID situation, I think the climate change is one of the most cha uh, biggest challenges that we had to face as a society. So I think understanding how cl climate works is very important. So I'm very thankful that Peter is here willing to explain that to us. So Peter, uh, the stage is yours. Great. Thanks, Pablo. Um, Right, so today I'm going to talk about uh, our climate and um, how our climate has changed leading up to uh, the change that we see today. Um, if anybody has any problems with uh, audio or visual, just type it in the chat and we can get it figured out. Um, so before we get started, the organizers asked me to talk a little bit about my background. Um, so like Pablo said, I'm a postdoc at CU Boulder. Um, I graduated from Caltech with a PhD in December. Um, for my PhD, I worked on data being returned from the Curiosity Rover. So on the left is a picture of me um, standing in front of the, the model rover at JPL. Uh, and so the, the switch to Earth might be a little bit surprising, uh, but it's actually not as big a change as it might seem uh, on its face. Um, I find that I'm really driven by questions about uh, where we come from and where we're going. Uh, and I enjoy opportunities to explore the world. Um, and being in earth science provides that kind of opportunity. So, you know, I've done some field work in the outback in Australia. I've gotten to climb around in caves and just uh, overall, it's been a, a really good experience being in science so far. So um, let's talk about the science. Uh, I'm gonna break this talk into kind of three main uh, uh, kind of chapters. First, I wanna talk about how the climate changes over time, and that includes the change that's happening today, but also includes the change that happened leading up to uh, the modern day. Uh, then I wanna talk about uh, what controls the, time that, the climate. Um, why is the climate changing at any given time in Earth's history? And then finally, um, why is it that New Guinea uh, occupies this kind of special place in uh, the climate's history? So to start off, uh, I think, uh, a good spot to start is that um, most people are familiar with this idea of uh, global warming, that uh, Howard gave a great introduction for this, for what Antarctica looks like today. It's cold, 
and icy and there's no plants there. Um, but as uh, humans produce CO2, uh, the atmosphere uh, and the climate warms up to the point that uh, depending on uh, future predictions of how much CO2 actually does get released, uh, Antarctica could look more like this in the future, like a, a temperate rainforest, something like um, Seattle might look like today. I think people are less familiar though with this idea that Antarctica uh, and the climate in general has been much warmer in the past. So again, Antarctica today is cold and icy, but 50 million years ago, Antarctica probably looked something like this. Uh, and we know this because there are fossils that have been collected down there that include ferns and crocodiles. Uh, obviously, you don't wind up with cold-blooded animals living in a, a place that looks like this. Just to put some numbers on this, uh, this is a graph of uh, the temperature of the, basically the temperature of the climate versus time. So on the x-axis is millions of years ago. So we're talking about very long periods of time. And you can see that, yes, in fact, 50 million years ago, uh, we do think the temperature was much higher. And since that time, it's been following this general downward trend um, that was really picking up speed beginning about 15 million years ago. And then there's this second uh, kink in the graph at about 4 million years ago uh, when the climate rapidly cools leading into today. Of course, if we were to include, uh, stretch this x-axis out so that we could see modern climate change, we would see it coming back up. So what causes this change? Well, if releasing CO2 causes the climate to warm, then exactly the opposite has happened here, where over the past 50 million years, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has fallen. Now, if we wanna understand where we're going and where we came from, uh, we need to understand uh, what, what's controlling the CO2 in the atmosphere because that's what's the major control on the climate. So right now, humans are the, the major control uh, on the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is because we're releasing large amounts of CO2 through industry, through air travel, uh, with ground transport. Um, and the really important aspect of this is that the CO2 release is happening uh, geologically very fast. So it takes, we've been doing this for decades. Uh, and in the past 100 years, we've uh, increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by over a third. All of this is in contrast with what normally provides the main control on uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that's rocks. Um, so before humans and after we're gone, uh, rocks will provide the, the strongest control on the amount of CO2 that's in the atmosphere. The caveat here is that unlike humans, which can change the deck, the um, the climate uh, in decades, rocks take millions of years. And so we don't really see their effects uh, with relation to human-caused climate change. So how do rocks actually do this, right? I think most people think of rocks as being fairly static and not doing a whole lot of anything. Um, it happens through chemistry, and it actually happens uh, in the reverse of the way that humans control the environment. So we're releasing CO2. Rocks, on the other hand, consume CO2, they, they take CO2 out of the atmosphere. So what I'm showing here is a chemical equation. Uh, for anybody who's not familiar with this, is uh, simply kind of like a math equation where you have one side that's related to the other side um, by things that are reacting together to produce the things on the right. So this reaction is called the weathering reaction, and this is the reaction that, that consumes CO2 uh, where rocks react with CO2 in the atmosphere and lower the atmospheric CO2. So rock, here I'm just showing a kind of a general chemistry of rock, magnesium, silicon, and oxygen, reacts with carbon dioxide, CO2, and water to dissolve the rock. So these dissolved parts of rock then just flow out in rivers and streams into the ocean. Uh, and you're left behind with basically what's the main component of sand. If it helps to think about this in kind of a graphic way, um, atmosphere with CO2 in it interacts with magnesium in fresh, unweathered rock. That pulls the CO2 out of the atmosphere and the dissolved components of the rock, the magnesium and the dissolved components of the atmosphere, this carbon, flow away in rivers and streams. And what you're left with is weathered rock uh, and an atmosphere that has less CO2 in it. Now, of course, there are always rocks 
at the surface of the earth, right? So what controls these changes in CO2? Why, does that, uh, why is that changing over time? Essentially, there are four major effects uh, that cause various different kinds of rocks in various places to consume more or less CO2. If you consume CO2 more rapidly, uh, you'll wind up with less CO2 in the atmosphere overall. So I'll walk through these one by one, but just to list them, list them right off the bat, uh, the first control is the chemistry of the rocks. It also matters whether the rocks are in a mountainous area. The local temperature is fairly important to the chemistry, and the amount of rain is also important. So number one uh, is the chemistry. Rocks with more magnesium lower CO2 more, so they consume more CO2. And again, this comes back to this chemical equation that I showed earlier. You'll notice magnesium uh, is uh, an important component. It's what's reacting with the CO2 uh, to dissolve the rock. So if you have less magnesium in your rocks, uh, you'll, you'll consume less CO2 and the atmosphere will overall have more CO2, the climate will be warmer. On the bottom here, I'm just showing a series of what these kinds of rocks look like. On the left is a fairly low magnesium rock, this is granite. And then on the, on the right side, uh, this is a very high magnesium rock, very magnesium rich, uh, it's called a dunite. Mountains are also important, uh, and this has to do with erosion. Um, if we think about the, uh, this, this weathered rock, what can essentially happen in a flat area, an area that looks like this, is that you'll build up a shield uh, that prevents the atmosphere from interacting with unweathered rock because there's this layer of weathered rock that's formed. In a mountainous area, on the other hand, fresh unweathered rock is always at the surface. And so there's always new rock available to interact with the atmosphere and consume CO2. Controls three and four are kind of related, so I'm going to talk about them at the same time. Um, essentially, both of them say that the biggest effects from climate, uh, or the biggest effects on climate, come from rocks that are in the tropics. So uh, the first is the what I mentioned is temperatures. So of course, uh, the tropics tend to be warmer; they're in the, near the equator. So I've uh, shown a map of the the, the tropics here in blue. Uh, and essentially, this is just because warmer temperatures cause chemistry. To happen more quickly so that weathering reaction can happen faster. More rain also causes faster weathering and there's actually two reasons for this and they're both related to things we've already talked about. One is erosion. Rain causes erosion and just like with the mountains will help expose fresh unweathered rock that can react with the atmosphere. Water is also a part of the chemical reaction that I showed. Uh, so of course that reaction can't happen if there's no water. And if there's more water, if it's raining frequently, then the reaction happens more quickly and you draw down more CO2. So let's come back to this question that I started with. Why did the earth cool off leading into today? Well, we know it's because carbon dioxide is falling, but now we have the keys to understand what might have caused the carbon dioxide to fall. We're looking for uh, the formation of magnesium rich rocks, in mountainous areas in the tropics where it's warm and where it rains frequently. So we're looking somewhere in this blue band for something that might be responsible and may have formed uh, in the time period that we're looking at here, these last 15 million years or so. And it turns out the place uh, that is um, most convincing uh, for uh, in this search is New Guinea. So New Guinea is this uh, fairly large island just north of Australia. And if we zoom in, we see it's, it is in fact mountainous. Uh, and its geology is made up of these really magnesium rich rocks. So we've got all four ingredients to really draw down CO2 out of the atmosphere. When we look at some models that people have done, um, just to give some context here, New Guinea covers about 1% of the Earth's land surface. In contrast to that, models say that it, uh, the island of New Guinea is responsible for about a fifth of the total CO2 consumption on Earth. So clearly, if this is way out of proportion uh, with other, other land areas on Earth. So then we should ask, when did the Earth cool exactly? And then when did New Guinea form exactly? Well, the first question is pretty easy. We can just look at this graph again. There's definitely cooling leading into uh, this time period here. But again, we see a real acceleration in cooling beginning at 15 million years ago, and then 
a second acceleration coincident with the building of an ice cap in the Northern Hemisphere about 4 million years ago. <clears throat> so the preliminary data that I've collected at Boulder so far says that New Guinea began to form sometime between 20 and 12 million years ago. We also have data that says that New Guinea began to get larger, that its growth kind of accelerated sometime between eight and three million years ago. So both of these are at least uh, consistent with the idea that New Guinea is causing the, the climate to cool. Uh, but of course, uh, we have more work to do. This is an ongoing project. Uh, and we're working to refine exactly what these dates might be to really constrain uh, the timing of when New Guinea formed versus when the, the, the climate cooled. <clears throat> so that's all I have. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we'll now open it up to the question and answer session. Remember, you can send your questions through chat, or you can send or raise your hand to ask questions directly. I think we have one question that Pablo is going to ask. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. That was a very interesting talk. And I used to think rocks of like an inert material, and it's interesting to see how they can still influence so many things like the weather in the whole world. So my question is related to the CO2 absorption of the of the rocks. So I've been hearing that actually this is a, instead of being a, only a natural process, people are thinking of this as a as a method to mitigate the the CO2 release. So somehow making it artificial. So you think this is a viable way to to capture CO2? Because I imagine it would affect a lot the the environment, like the the rocks and the in the landscape? Yeah, I don't know if I have the kind of the right set of knowledge to really answer that question well. Uh, I mean, from a theoretical standpoint, it definitely works. I mean, you can take, uh, I think the, the proposals that I've seen have been to take olivine, which is a really magnesium rich uh, mineral and grind it up uh, and basically just dump it in the ocean and let it do this reaction really quickly. In theory, that works uh, and it would probably draw down CO2. The question we need to ask, well, there's two questions. One is, are there any side effects that we haven't thought about? Um, <clears throat> there tends to be a lot of nickel in olivine, which I'm not an environmental chemist, but my understanding is that that's not good for the ocean. Uh, and it takes a lot of energy to collect rocks like that and grind it up. So you may not actually wind up coming out ahead in terms of how much CO2 you consume through the process versus how much you release by uh, going through a process like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have one question from chat. Uh, what methods are you using to determine uh, when New Guinea formed? Hmm. So uh, by training, I'm a, a geochronologist, which means that I study how old rocks are. Uh, what we're doing here is called thermochronology, which is kind of a related topic um, where we're asking uh, how long it's been since a, a given rock was at a specific temperature. And the way this works is uh, you have radioactive elements like uranium in rock that decay at a, a known steady rate. That decay produces new elements. So when uranium decays, it produces uh, helium, actually. That helium gets trapped in the rock, but when the rock exceeds a certain temperature, uh, for the mineral I'm using, uh, appetite, uh, it leaves the rock at about 60 degrees Celsius. So based on um, the amount of time it's been since uh, a grain of appetite, so a single uh, mineral of appetite was 60 degrees, uh, we can determine uh, how quickly it's come up from that depth and essentially to figure out how quickly an island has been built. That's a good question. Okay, and we have one question, uh, one audience member with their hand up. Uh, Jessica. Hi, thanks, it's me again. Um, I have a comment and a question. My comment is, this is really cool. Um, New Guinea seems incredible. Uh, doesn't it have like one fifth of the world's languages as well? Um, anyway, the, um, amazing result. Uh, my question is, are there are any other large land masses like this that you can see large, change it correspond to their formation their formation corresponds to large changes um like we see in the uh, recent 50 million year history 
uh, so the answer to your first question is I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I actually am not going to be doing field work in New Guinea for this project because we have samples that were already provided to us. So unfortunately, I don't actually get to go. Uh, the second question is a good one. Um, I'm actually part of a larger project working on what controls Earth's climate on, on long time scales. Uh, and our working hypothesis right now is that islands like New Guinea, so um, New Guinea is produced by a process called arc continent collision, where island arcs kind of, uh, think of Japan or the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, through plate tectonics collide with uh, a continental plate. That forms a lot of these, um, these magnesium rich rocks that I've been talking about. And when they happen, when these collisions happen in the tropics, uh, people that do uh, reconstructions of where the plates were in the past can actually line these uh, arc continent collisions in the tropics. They can line them up with times that we think the, the climate was much cooler. Um, and they, they actually line up quite well. And so um, my part in this project is working on the, the ongoing one where we can get really good high quality data to understand how this process works in detail. That's a good question too. Thanks. All right, thank you, Peter. And, and thank you uh, to all the speakers. And I think Pablo has some concluding remarks. Yes, I want to add you uh, in thanking the speaker for their excellent and informative talks. Unfortunately, you cannot hear our class, but we are really thankful for your participation in this event, which otherwise wouldn't be possible. So thanks very much. And also we want to thank the audience for your participation. We hope that you, like us, are learning some interesting science done by our colleague at Caltex. And related to this event, so we are thinking about expanding the, the Explore Caltech uh, online session for, for a while. So we want to encourage any researcher at the audience to still sign up for, for giving a talk in this event because social events are going to be limited uh, for a while. So we want to still offer the opportunity to connect with research at Caltech and keep the information and the science flowing as it, was, as it is supposed to be. So again, uh, just encouraging you to, to sign up for next talks. Uh, also, I want to remind that the next session that is now scheduled is going to be for uh, May 20. So uh, it's going to be in the same platform and it's going to be at the same time, but we will also send some reminder uh, via email for, for those of you who, who subscribe. And finally, I also want to remember that uh, all the videos of these, of these talks are going to be updated in the web page, so you can go there and, and see the event after work and also the information for the next talk. So that's everything from my side, so stay safe and see you next week.